meeting. Um, you're all very welcome uh, to the meeting today. Um, just to give members a brief overview of the, some of the topics we're going to cover today, um, we have two oral evidence sessions with departmental officials. Um, the first on the 2021 to 22 October monitoring round and budget 22 25 process, and the second on the results of the consultation and proposed next steps in relation to the proposed strategy for supporting and challenging women and girls in contact with the justice system. We'll have a summary of the committee's informal deliberations on the damages return on investment bill. Uh, we'll have the civil jurisdiction and judgments 2005 Hague Convention and 2007 Hague Convention Amendment Regulations 2022. And we also have written papers on domestic abuse offence training and awareness materials, implementation of the rec recommendations of the Gillen Review into serious sexual offences in Northern Ireland and deaths abroad. Um, the final report on the commencement of Section 49.1 on the Coroners and Justice Act 20, sorry, 2009. Um, so we are going to start the meeting in public session. And as always, you're welcome to have your mobile device out, but can you please make sure it's muted or it's on airplane mode? Um, as members know, we're obliged to declare any financial or other relevant interests that might reasonably be thought by others to influence their approach to the matter under consideration. So if any members have any declarations of interest, now is your chance to raise them. Okay, I don't see any members indicating, so we'll move on. Um, so can I get agreement from members <coughs> for the two oral evidence sessions to be reported by Hansard? Yep. Thank you. Um, okay, so we'll go start on the pack, um, and if you go to agenda item one, apologies, and um, we have apologies from the chair, Mervyn Story, from Doug Beatty, and from Emma Rogan. And we have Rachel Woods and Sinead Bradley joining us on Starleaf, so they're very welcome. Chair, can I, at this stage, from an apology, I may have to leave the meeting for a short time, and we'll wait in the call. Thank you. Okay, Sinead, no problem. Thank you. Um, Gemma Dolan and Peter Weir are here in person, but I know Peter has to leave the uh, meeting at four and Gemma has to leave for a short period as well. Um, so I'm, I know members have delegated authority. Is that right? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, Marvin Story has delegated his vote to uh, Peter Weir. Emma has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chair, Sinead, and Gemma Dolan has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chair during the short time she may have to leave yeah. the meeting. Okay. No problem, thank you. Okay, if we move on to agenda <coughs> item two, which is the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 23rd of September. Um, you'll find this at pages 5 to 17 of your pack. Um, I presume members have had a, a chance to look through them. Um, and are members content that the minutes in the pack are a true reflection of the proceedings of the meeting held on the 23rd of September? Great. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. So I'll sign. I don't think we have them here, but I'll sign them. Yep, I'll sign them at some stage before the <laughs> meeting's over. Um, okay. So agenda item three is matters arising. So first up, we have the Department of Justice correspondence requesting changes to the Committee Forward Work Programme. Um, so members, the department has asked for five proposals for statutory rules that all relate to the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill to be added to the work programme for the meeting on the 21st of October, and it also wants to rename the title of the other SL1 scheduled on that date. Um, you'll find information relating to this at pages 19 and 20 of the pack. Um, so are members in agreement that we make those changes to our forward work programme? Thank you. Um, item two, there is a letter from an individual on the legislative consent motion on the public service pension and judicial um, offices bill. Um, the Committee for Finance is currently considering um, a legislative consent motion on the Public Service Pension and Judicial um, Office Bill uh, and wrote to, uh, to the other relevant statutory committees to request views and comments. At the meeting last week, the committee agreed that a draft response based on the scrutiny undertaken on relevant areas covered in the LCM would be prepared and circulated to members for agreement to enable a response to be sent to the Finance Committee in time for its meeting yesterday. Um, no comments were received on the draft response, and it was received. Uh, sorry, it was uh, forwarded to the finance committee, um, and that information relating to that is at pages three to eleven on the table pack uh, for members' information. We did have an individual um, who wrote to the committee with comments on the provisions within the LCM on public services pension, pensions, and judicial um, offices bill. This was circulated to members by email last Friday, and that's found at 21 to 23 of the meeting pack. 
and the correspondence refers to pensions for prison officers, <coughs> uh, which fall within wider public sector pensions for which the Department of Finance is responsible, and this was therefore not considered by the committee. Uh, so can I ask members just to note that item of correspondence? Um, so item three is a response from the NI Human Rights Commission on the proposed legislative consent motion on the Police, Crime, Sentencing and Courts Bill. The committee agreed at the meeting on the 9th of September to forward the Department of Justice a response dated the 17th of August to the issues raised by the NI Human Rights Commission on the proposed legis legislative consent motion uh, on the Police, Crime, Sentencing Scenes and Courts Bill uh, to the Commission for information and any further comments it may wish to make. The Human Rights Commission has responded, indicating that it has received a copy of the Draft Code of Practice in respect of data extraction from mobile devices, which it had raised in previous correspondence and has provided a response to the Department. The Commission has urged the Committee to protect the monitoring and review of oversight functions and had no further comments to add at this time in respect of the other provisions that will be included in the LCM. And the correspondence relating to that item is found at pages 12 to 13 of the tabled paper. And can I just remind members that the Department also wrote to the Committee on the 16th of June to advise that the Executive did not agree to the inclusion of the measure relating to the extraction of information from mobile devices in the LCM, but may return to the issue once the Code of Practice has been drafted and consulted on. So, members, um, on the back of that, um, I just want to seek agreement from yourselves to forward the um, NI Human Rights um, Commission correspondence to the Department of Justice. Um, and also request assurance that the Commission's view on the Code of Practice will be conveyed to the Home Office and request details of other stakeholders that the Department has consulted with on the Code of Practice. Are members in agreement with that approach? Great. Great. Thank you. Okay, item four is the Troubles Permanent Disablement uh, Payment Scheme. The arrangements are being made uh, for the informal meeting with the Victims Payments Board to discuss the Troubles Permanent Disablement, disablement uh, Payment Scheme and the arrangements for monitoring its operation to take place on Wednesday, the 6th of October at 10 a.m. And that will be via Microsoft Teams. Uh, the Chair and poss possibly some other members of the committee for the executive office will also participate in the meeting given the executive office is the sponsor department for the victims payment uh, board um, and just remember information an email was sent to them earlier today regarding the meeting um, and uh, basically just asking us to advise the committee team as soon as possible and um, if we wish to attend um, and so that they can make the necessary uh, arrangements and that can be all finalized so that's really just for members to note Sure, just uh, it helps. I'm uh, not available at that. Certainly, from my point of view, not available at that time because at the same time as the economy committee's sitting. So, okay. okay. I think, yeah, we were trying to get organised because the committee had wanted it before the seventh. No, I understand. I'm not. Oh, and I'm not. Yeah. I'm not in any way suggesting uh -huh. that no. there's any alteration uh -huh. to the time. But just from the point of view of an apology or whatever in, in relation to that. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Um, so, agenda item four: the. 2021 to 22 October monitoring round um, and the budget 22 to 25 process um, and this is our first oral evidence session with departmental officials um, so we have officials attending the meeting today via Starleaf and they're going to outline the department's October monitoring round position um, and information gathering for the budget 22 to 25 um, process so these the papers in relation to this are, are at pages 36 to 109 of your pack um, so we, we have been given very helpfully um, just some issues that we may wish to discuss um, after the evidence session. So I think members will have, have a chance to have a look at those and, and probably find them quite useful. So just can I welcome to the meeting Deborah Brown, the Director of um, Justice Delivery Directorate, Andrea Qu uh, Quayle, Head of Financial Planning, Strategy and Support, and Louise Blair, Head of Financial Planning and Support at the Department of Justice. To the meeting and um, so you're all very welcome and thank you so much for joining us and um, for this item and just to make you aware that the uh, this session will be will, it will be reported by Hansard and the transcript will be published on the committee's web page so I think it's yourself and um, Deborah are you going to kick <coughs> us off if you want to give us just yes. a, an outline of the um, of the October monitoring round position and the the 22 to 25 budget process yes thank you can I just check that you can hear us okay yes we can yeah Super, thank you. So good afternoon um, and thank you for the opportunity to provide um, an update on the DOJ budget. 
as you stated, um, join me this afternoon. I have Andrea Quayle, our Head of Financial Planning Strategy, and Louise Blair, our Head of Financial Planning Support. So today we are going to aim to give you an update on where we are on our October monitoring round and on the returns that have been submitted to date as part of the budget gathering exercise for 22 to 25. Returning to the main area for discussion today, October monitoring round, this is the second monitoring round of the year. And as you're aware, this year continues to be very difficult in terms of our budget pressures and the continuing uncertainty created by COVID-19. When finalising the budget 21-22, the department had significant resource pressures, which at that stage were estimated at £55 million, excluding the COVID-19 pressures. This reduced to approximately £27.7 million as a result of a reduction in the PSNI pressures of £14.3 million and an in-year allocation of £9.8 million for the PSNI. These pressures are further reduced to 23.9 million in the June monitoring round. In June monitoring round, the department bid to DOF for these pressures of 23.9 million, plus 16 million for compensation services pressures, resulting from a change in the personal injury discount rate, a total bid of 39.9 million. Allocations for the June monitoring round totaled 11.5 million leaving pressures exiting June monitoring round of 28.4 million, round, million pounds. As part of the October monitoring round, the pressures have been reviewed again and they have further reduced to 25.4 million. While there have been some movements of pressures increasing and decreasing across our business areas, the main change here is a reduction in the pressure being faced by compensation services in respect of the personal injury discount rate of £3 million. Pounds. The compensation services pressure was estimated on a range um, of pressures estimated at that point, and we bid to DOF for £16 million. Pounds. That has now been updated and has reduced by £3 million. The executive did provide £5 million as part of the June monitoring allocation, and therefore this is a pressure of £8 million. Pounds. DOF has advised that negotiations are ongoing with HMT in relation to these costs and should funding be received from HMT, this will be held centrally for reallocation. There does, however, remain uncertainty in relation to the timing and the quantum of these settlements and we will continue to keep these under review throughout the year. In relation to PSNI pressures within the 25.4 million, a bid will be submitted to DOF in the October monitoring round for 3.4 million in relation to the EU exit pressures, as the funding required for the, P for the Northern Ireland Protocol to HMT will not be met um, at this stage. The COVID-19 pressure is being bid for of 1.1 million and a McLeod pressure of 134,000 pounds. So overall, taking all of this into account, the department will submit bids to TOF of 25.4 million, which are set out in Annex 1 of your paper. And this includes the 8 million pounds for the compensation services payments. Should all of these pressures be met, the department would leave the October monitoring round with 1.7 million of unallocated funding and 334,000 pounds earmarked for Gillen with pressures remaining of 1.275 million. And these pressures, along with any unmet bids, would then be reviewed following October monitoring round and considered again at the June, January monitoring. Also to highlight that we do have some ring-fenced easements and as a consequence, those must be surrendered. These total 914,000 pounds and they relate to the Office of the Police Ombudsman of, for Historical Investigations of £430,000. The Together Building a United Community Programme of £295,000 and COVID funding of £189,000. Uh, Moving now to capital, in the 21-22 budget was allocated in full as part of the opening budget exercise. And we did leave June monitoring round with an easement of £846,000. 
Further easements have now been identified as part of the October wanting round, bringing the total to 2.276 million, which will now be surrendered to DOF. As part of the October wanting round, we will also update our ring fenced resource dial, which is a technical budget to cover depreciation and impairment costs. We have received bids of 4.3 million for ring fenced resource dial for which the department currently holds a million pounds. We will allocate that and bid for the remainder of 3.2 million. <coughs> this would leave the department with no remaining unallocated ring fenced resource dial. We have also reduced our annually managed expenditure budget and we will agree movements and bids as part of this round of 33.7 million pounds. Moving now to the Budget 22-25 process. Budgets beyond 21-22 have not yet been set. The Department of Finance formally commissioned the Budget 22-25 process, the information gathering exercise for Resource Dell on the 6th of August. You have been provided with a copy of our return and this exercise continues. The capital exercise was commissioned by the Department of Finance on the 9th of September, with those returns being due this week. The Chancellor formally commenced a multi-year spending review on the 7th of September, with the outcome to be announced on the 27th of October. The Executive's funding envelope is set by the spending review, and therefore our ability to set a multi-year budget is constrained by the period which is covered by that spending review. Treasury has announced that the period to be covered by that spending review will be the three years for both Resource Dell and Capital Dell, and DOF intend to plan the Executive's budget on this basis. So in conclusion, I hope that this has provided a useful overview um, of where we are in terms of our financial position in the DOJ, and we will continue to keep this under review as this is a very challenging, challenging budget at this stage. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to brief you and we very much value the role and the views of the committee and we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, yeah, that was very useful. Thanks very much. Um, I have a couple of questions and then I, I know Peter's looking in and I'll, I'll, I'll open it up to other members as well. Um, firstly, just on the, uh, the returning of the 914 thousand, um, specifically the, the 430 care for the police ombudsman, the 295 for TBOC and the 189 for the courts um, service COVID funding. Could you give us just a wee bit more detail just on that? Why why was it not used? What was the reason? Yeah, first, uh, whatever's left. Okay, um, so moving to these first of all. Um, <clears throat> so um, with regard to um, our uh, courts and tribunals, the COVID funding, so they had some increased um, pressures um, and also some um, easements within the COVID funding, but because it was given for those purposes, we have to return it to DOF as that was the purpose for which it was intended. Um, there has been some issues um, with regard to the, um, the TBOC fund um, where there was a little bit of slippage, and so that will be returned to the centre and hopefully will be used for other um, TBOC programmes. Um, <clears throat> And then the other one, which was the Oconee one, um, with regard to this one, um, this is where we have some easements um, coming out um, of the office of the Oconee. And sorry, I'm just looking for my exact lines on this one. Yes, so we had an easement um, at June monitoring round um, of 1.1, and now we have this further easement of 430. Um, this is where we had late notification um, of the budget allocation um, to your pony, and so therefore that delayed their ability um, to proceed with the recruitment of staff. And so therefore at this stage, this is a slippage on this. So it shouldn't um, create any additional pressures, but does just push the, the requirement for the funding um, into future years. Okay, thank you for that, Deborah. And just on the the bid of 3.4 million for the, um, for the PSNI Brexit pressures and implementation of the protocol, just wondering if you can give us some understanding or more detail around what those specific pressures are. Um, I know in the pack, the, the, you know, the mention around criminal activity and, and, and such, but you know, has there been any evidence that there will, you know, there is or there will be increased criminal activity to justify the 3.4 million? So, 
So um, part of this um, is to do with recurrent costs, which is to do with 308 existing officers, which were recruited back in 1819. Um, and therefore, we have to make sure that we are continuing to fund those moving forward. Um, there also are things around the C3 portal units and the CCTV systems that are needed um, across the designated ports. Um, and the PSNI wish to retain the additional EU exit posts going forward to ensure that those benefits can be um, realised. There is certainly still uncertainty associated with the outworking um, of the protocol, including the longer term arrangements around replacing um, the temporary and the time and grace period solutions which were agreed under the protocol. Um, and depending on how these issues are resolved, there may be further downstream impacts that might be felt. Um, so I think it's one of those ones where it is continued to be kept under review, but these are existing costs where they've put in staffing, etc., in order to manage the protocol moving forward. Okay, thank you for that, Deborah. Um, okay, I have Peter and then I have Robin. Thank you, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Deborah, and the team for um, the information you've given so far. Which I want to break down just my questions into two sections, but I'll, I'll try and get each section just in one go. First of all, on the monitoring round side of it, those three issues just I want to, to touch on. I know the, the Chair touched on the, the police ombudsman's money, but um, it does appear to be in a number of occasions where I think that, that the there has been an underspend there and money has had to be allocated back. So I suppose I want to check up, first of all, are the department confident that the, the baselines for the police ombudsman's office are, are, are got correct? Secondly, if you can give me a bit more detail, I mean, it's welcome that, that um, seeking additional money, but I suppose then the issue is whether there's additional uh, pressure or rising demand in terms of referrals. There's obviously um, a bid in for 300,000 in terms of <coughs> modern slavery victims, and it's important that they are supported, but I suppose it's maybe to get a sense of where that's directed, and this, is this sort of showing increasing problems within, um, within issues around, around trafficking? And thirdly, on the monitoring side of it, on the capital side, there appears to be then an increase in terms of the levels of easements. And again, just in terms of the capital budget, if you could maybe just give us a bit more detail as to where those have, have come from and how those, those have arisen just. And I'll come to the, the okay, one. So with regard to um, the issue around um, our, our current unders underspends, um, you know, the issue here moving forward is that we continue to monitor the impacts um, of, of COVID as we move forward and we are in certain times. This is the, the position that we are at the moment. The understands here are quite small. You know, there are significant pressures that we're facing, which is why we are bidding for such um, a, a substantial um, amount at this point in time. Um, the modern slavery, sorry, I've just, and would you want to see, the, uh, the modern slavery, I think the requirements in modern slavery um, has it increased? They have a baseline of about three hundred um, and, and fifty thousand pounds, and um, so we have a statutory obligation, obviously, to provide support to the victims. Um, back in twenty twenty one, there was approximately a need for about three hundred thousand more than the budget, um, and we were able to make savings elsewhere to try and manage those moving forward. Um, this is one that we will keep under review, um, but again, um, it, it's one that we do place significant. Um, you know, focus on um, and to make sure that we're able that, to provide is that, for them. Is that through increased identification of victims? It's maybe a slightly double-edged sword because if you're seeing, if, if we're catching more perpetrators and therefore supporting more victims, obviously that's a good thing. On the flip side of the coin, the fact that the need for that level of additional spend is maybe showing that the problem at least is not dissipating, <coughs> it's, it's increasing. It would maybe be useful to get, if we can't even in writing, get a bit more detail just in connection with that. Absolutely. Um, look, I will take that away and try and get some more detail for you. Just then on the capital side. Okay, so on our capital. <laughs> so within this, um, the largest easement that we had in our capital um, was about 500,000 points, which was to do with the State Authority Case Management System. Um, that has a budget of about a million pounds for the introduction of this system, but unfortunately the timeline for that has slipped, um, and that will slip obviously um, into um, next year. Um, we estimate that we just need the, the five hundred thousand pounds um, this year, so we will keep that under review. Um, 
Uh, the other ones are, are much smaller amounts. Um, we have a bit of a slippage in our remote, uh, our remote evidence centre where there has changed the timing of the programme there. Um, we have some delays in some of our ICT projects um, in the prisons. Um, we have small slippages in a few projects in um, forensic science. Um, and there, have, there were some fit out costs for offices which, which were then actually needed. Um, so that was the, those are the reasons um, for the, the small number of, of easements that we have in our capital budget at this stage. Okay, and then just, uh, what, just want to ask two points just on the budget moving forward. Um, first of all, do you have any indication of what the total liabilities in terms of the McLeod judgment across department agencies will be? Any estimate of that? Uh, and secondly, I know that the PSNI have outlined, uh, in terms of transformation side of things, they've outlined, if they like, three business cases. One, in terms of police numbers, but also in terms of uh, digital services and estates. And we know quite often with transformation, uh, the aim obviously is that those, that any transformation can produce certain long-term savings, but it's almost inevitable that forms of transformation tend to have a, a, an upfront cost before they start achieving those. And I'm just wondering in terms of the looking ahead towards the bids, uh, uh, unless I've got this wrong, uh, that there's, a, uh, there's an allocation in terms of the increase in police numbers, but there doesn't appear to be moving ahead particular bids in terms of additional transformation costs on either the digital or the estate side of things. So I'm just wondering maybe you could give a, an explanation on that as well. Okay, so the, the digital and the estates are both capital projects, and um, so those are being considered as part of the capital exercise, and, and you're absolutely right, there are significant large costs involved in those, um, and those business cases are currently under development, and we're working closely with the PSNI on those, and there is also um, an associated business case being constructed around the police numbers. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, can I just ask, I didn't quite catch what the liability was that you that Just you in, in relation to the uh, McLeod judgment. Okay, so that is one that um, is across the board. Um, you know, the, the figures at this moment are, are very high level estimates that will depend on the number of people that come forward. Um, we have made DOF aware of, of our position on that, but we don't have numbers that we'll be able to, to quote at this stage. Okay, thank you Chair. Thank you, Peter. You, you finished, yeah? Yep, yep. Thank you. Uh, Robin? Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can I thank the officers uh, for coming to the committee today? Um, just a, a couple of questions. Um, can I just ask, uh, in terms of the department has identified a number of areas um, which should be considered as exempt from reductions. Can I maybe just ask you to concentrate maybe a bit on the area around the tackling paramilitarism and TBUC uh, being exempt from reductions. And I ask that question really in terms of, um, I'm not saying I wouldn't be supportive of that, but I, and because I, I have been pushing to have uh, certainly the, the, the lines around TBUC uh, altered to, to bring in areas of need. Uh, and obviously the, the paramilitary situation uh, has not improved. So can I ask maybe the department to talk around that area, please? So um, both TBUC um, and the Tackling Paramilitarism are cross-departmental um, initiatives um, being led by the TEO. Um, we only have a small element of this funding. Um, in regards to the Tackling Paramilitarism, there's an allocation um, from, from the executive and then there's also an allocation from the UK government. <clears throat> as far as I'm aware there has been work done which supports the, this, this amount of funding and indeed I think would actually highlight that there's a requirement for additional funding. We know that spending in this area is something that would save, funding, save money obviously in the longer term and so therefore from our point of view it's really important that an important programme like that and TBOC are both ring fence to make sure that we can realise the benefits from those as soon as possible. Okay, and is it, is it possible, I know they're multi-funding, but is it possible for those to be moved into the department's baseline? No, because they're cross-cutting, they because are always they are. held at the responsible department. Okay. Because what they do is they look at the programme and then they look at what are all the, all the projects which are delivering on the objectives and then they decide who needs what in what year, etc. And it also has the benefit that whenever we return funding, it can be redistributed across the other departments, so it does work in a more streamlined way. Okay. Uh, can I ask, 
I mean, I, I know I'm not the only elected representative to be um, looking for some tea buck money to be spent uh, in their constituency and so on. How do we arrive at a situation when we're tackling um, all of the issues around deprivation and so on that we end up returning such a, in tea buck terms, such a significant amount of money? How, how do we arrive at that situation? So I think um, with, with T-Buck, we are dependent on, on other partners around our delivery on these and how they are prioritised. Um, so I think that the T-Buck budget, is, when it's being managed centrally, allows for that kind of element of slippage. So whatever you're planning, you will have a number of projects who, if they actually did all deliver, might actually exceed your budget, but you know that you always have an element of slippage. So actually, you're always relying on the fact that there will be a bit of slippage in your planning. So I don't think that that's to be unexpected in the way and the way in which we, we manage all of those programmes centrally. Yeah, but it's not, it's not a wee bit of slippage, it's a significant amount. Just, I can't find it here, but just confirm for me what the amount 2, is. 2,905, or sorry, 295,000. 300,000 pounds is, is and not an insignificant amount of money, Chair, in, in terms of community uh, work. Mm -hmm. And considering it's within fairly tight geographical areas. Uh, okay, um, can I ask then... I would say that it goes back into the centre and, and will be used for other projects in TBOOK. Yeah, that, that's, that's fair enough. Um, at least it, others may value, but it was allocated for, for these projects and we've failed to spend it uh, in, in that area. Okay, that's, that's fine. Can I ask about the um, revenue raising uh, and particularly around court fees? Um, how, how, do our, how do our court fees uh, compare with uh, England, Scotland and Wales or, or indeed even the Republic? I do not have that detail with me, I apologise. I can get that for you. So we don't know whether our court fees are higher or lower? Colleagues in the department will, but we in finance don't have that information with us today, but we can get that for you. But we've identified court fees as a potential revenue raising. <clears throat> yes, and, th and that's when we're exploring it. Um, and we would be taking into account and exploring what those fees would be by looking at what's happening in other jurisdictions. But the challenges here will be the time delay in us being able to put this in place because we will need secondary legislation. So by the time we you know, are able to realise savings, we could be a couple of years down the line. Um, but I can get you some information on how they currently compare to England and Wales um, and Ireland. Okay, I think that would be useful, Chair, if, if that was the mind of the committee to, to receive that. Uh, I just note that you know we have been able to recover an increase from in 2016 73% to 77% in March 2020. Uh, are, are we even considering perhaps building in an inflationary cost as opposed to maybe just increasing the cost? Maybe the two, same thing, two, same thing a different way. But I can just get that information clarified for you. Okay. All right, um, just one last one then. Um, yeah, sorry, maybe just, uh, I've, I've lost my place, Chair. Um, maybe just ask you the officials to clarify the next stages of the draft process. If, and can I come so back and find my place? Yeah, can I come no, back? I'll not put you under pressure. No, that's okay, Robin. We'll come back to you at the end. So we'll go to Gemma, Rachel. And then Sinead, and we'll come back to you. Robert. All right, okay, thank you, Gemma, Chair. Go ahead. All right, thanks, Chair, and thank you, Deborah, Andrea, and Louise, for your presentation. Um, can I just ask, can I go back to the areas Robin was talking about, the key priority areas within the budget that the department want exempt from cuts? Um, what criteria is used by the department to determine uh, which areas should be exempt from reductions? So when we look at the areas for reduction, we're looking at those areas where we have limited control um, over, over the costs. 
um, where they are deemed to be um, a key priority. So you will see there we have obviously the, the EU exit, um, that's funding um, that would have a significant impact if we did not get that going forward. Legacy remains a key priority um, for the department. Um, the issue around PSNI police officers, you'll be aware um, of the NDNA commitments, etc. on that. So those are the sorts of criteria that were used in establishing these. Um, you'll see legal aid in there. Legal aid is demand led. Um, and indeed, the legal aid baseline budget is actually insufficient to meet the demand that we have experienced over the last, last number of years and have always had to, to bid in year. Um, with regard to the compensation services, again, um, you're made aware of the challenges that we have now with the increases around the statutory discount rate. And again, that is a demand led service. So again, that's why we would be saying that there should not be any um, cuts to that either. And then we've already discussed um, the cross-cutting um, ones around tackling paramilitarism and TBUC. Okay, yeah, thanks. That makes sense. And my other question is, um, in terms of the bids um, that the department's submitting uh, to meet a range of resource pressures, what plans um, will be put in place to manage these pressures if the bid is unsuccessful? So we will await the outcome of the October monitoring round, which we hope would be um, towards the end of October, um, and we will then sit down and look at what we have um, managed to secure, and look at the remaining pressures and where we have any ability to slow down or stop expenditure, as the case may be. However, as you can see from the bids, there are some things in there which are now truly inescapable around pay and price, etc. So there will be limits around what we can do, but we do plan to come back in early November when we know the outcome of October morning round to decide what are our next steps. Okay, that's okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Gemma. Rachel, do you want to go ahead? Thank you, Senator, um, and thank you very much for your presentation and the um, the pack that was um, given to us for today. Um, there's been a number of, of questions already asked, and I just want to bring back to TBAC and apologies if this has already been asked and quite difficult with my sound here in Bangor with the um, the internet. The, the TBAC 295 grand um, that was for and it was being returned because of slippage, is that because particular projects didn't go ahead because of the COVID pandemic? No, uh, it's not because of COVID. Um, there was a, a small easement. Um, there's a, it's a two phased project, which is being taken forward with DFC um, and IFI funding. Um, so DFC are covering some of the costs in the 21-22, but the costs that relate to us around the removal of the Valley Go Martin interface and its replacement won't now be incurred until next year. Okay, thank you. So the this the two hundred and that that was the two hundred and ninety five grand was for that one particular project, and yes. then that would be re basically that's going to come back then next year. So we'll see this next year. Yeah. So yeah. as I say, the way things get managed would be anticipate slippage in these projects. So that will go back in, and whoever can use it this year will, and hopefully in our allocation next year will be reallocated it back out. Okay. Thank you. So just to clarify that. Um, Okay, in terms of the um, departmental letter that was with part of our pack under M, it, it says that the department is submitting a bid as part of monitoring around 65,000 for legal aid costs in relation to the personal injury discount rate litigation cases on access to justice. What, what legal costs are these? Because I see in the table in Appendix 1, it also says compensation services for change in the personal injury discount rate June bid, 16 grand. Funding received is um, five thousand. Sorry, this is million. Apologies, sixteen million, five million. Revised June pressure, eleven million, and then the October bid is eight million. What? What? Are, what's that for? And what's the difference then between the legal costs and the the cheat the compensation services? Yeah, I'll let Louise cover that one. Thank you. The smaller amount, the sixty-five thousand, in relation to access to justice. That's legal costs um, of a as far as I understand, a JR against the department. So that's the, the department's legal costs in relation to that. Um, and then in terms of the, the bigger amounts against compensation services, so that's the increase in the compensation payable to victims um, under the new uh, personal injury discount rate, obviously the, temp the, the rate that's in at present under the old scheme. And then obviously that, that will potentially change then in January. 
or in early early in the new year. So that's the pressure arising in compensation services for the victims' payments. Okay, so that that was just what I wanted to clarify. So and the the June bid was sixteen million. That would have been the interim rate then, and yes, the. So it was received as five million, and then the October bid it was revised down then to eleven. It was a revised down because there wasn't as many people um, claiming or settling at that time. There's there's a number of uncertainties around this, which is quite outside the department's control, both in terms of the timing and the quantum of the amounts. So we have updated the the forecast pressure based on the information that we know at this point in time, and again we'll review that very closely, um, we're keeping a, a very close eye on it in advance of J January monitoring. Thank you, sorry, it's just obviously, you know, the committee's looking at the the, um, the, the, the bill at the moment um, and, and today, so just, it just it's, it's um, good to get some, some sort of numbers in terms of budgets. Um, the, finally for me, Chair, just the, on page 50 on template one, the strategic assessment form under legal aid, it says that there's legal aid pressure, which has been stated at 17.8 million funding shortfall over the next number of years. Then it goes on to say it will be further exacerbated by the Domestic Abuse and Civil Proceedings Act, which was passed this year and given the amendment, um, which would further increase the cost of legal aid bill um, against the advice of DOJ. But no further financial pressure, though, has been itemised underneath that section. Um, it's just the if if there is if there's going to be um, a further increase of the cost of legal aid bill with regard to the um, amendment in the tobacco abuse bill, has there been any uh, financial sort of forecasting on that? Obviously, 17.8 million funding shortfall over those years, but um, hasn't been outlined. Is that is that going to be outlined? So within the, the pressures that are faced by LSA, they have taken into account at this point what they know um, around the, the impacts of those. So those are all factored in at this stage. Um, as I said earlier, you know, the, the LSA does start you know, a bit behind the ball because it has not got a baseline that has met its demand in the past number of years. Then you have the issues about the catch up with regard to COVID, etc. And then you also have us meeting the demand that's coming through and the additional pressures that are caused by the different bills, the domestic abuse bill and others. So there's a there's a number of things that are built in behind that that figure work. Thank you. And just finally, I maybe don't have the information, just in terms of the, um, it was against the advice of the Department of Justice. Um, do, it, was that specific advice that was was given to by the Department of Justice? Sorry, was that the advice from Legal Services Agency? This is the, so this is the template that you're reading. Um, just yeah, page, page 50 of our pack, it's um, template one strategic assessment form. Which is the, the paragraph that says that the act is amended and the assembly will further increase the cost of the legal aid bill against the advice of DOJ. Yeah, so this is this is where um, we have the we're having to work through the issues around the, the waiver. Um, so there are costs mm. associated with you know, removing the financial eligibility issue. So those are increased costs which we had never built into our business case, and we're as you know we're now currently working our way through that. So that's what that is referencing. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Sinead. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you to the officials for being here. Um, and a lot has been covered. And I just wanted to know, just picking up um, on Rachel's final point, whether that is normal process to write against um, the advice of the department. I don't know why that's stated. Um, a bill is a bill, as far as I'm concerned, and I'd just be keen to know if we could have feedback if that is common practice and if there are examples of that type of language being used um, at that stage in terms of measures, and I appreciate that it wasn't something that was factored in, and it may be there as a note to officials more than anything else, but it is quite sensitive in my view. Um, and if I could go back, and I, uh, Chair, a lot has been answered to be fair, so I'm not going to labour on anything unnecessarily, but I would like to go back to the um, tea book again, if, if that's okay. And it's, uh, it's about the um, money that was being returned, and we've already established that that was 
down to just one scheme, which took me a bit by surprise, and I would be eager to know uh, just a little bit more detail on what that one scheme is and why it was delayed and how exactly that amount of money, because it is quite sizable amount of money. Um, I know it's referenced as small, and it may be small in terms of the overall budget, but it's still a significant amount of money, as is the uh, 189000 for the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Services in terms of COVID money. And I'd be eager to know that that is the slippage, but what is that? What sort of percentage is that of the overall budget that was allocated um, to the COVID-19 money? And you know, why was that unable to be spent? And I, I know it was unable to be spent and that, that has been repeated, but I haven't really heard why, what, what happened to um, disallow spending on that. Thank you. Okay, so we'll need to come back to you on the further detail on the t -buck. Um, I've given you what I have on it at this point, so we'll come back on that one. Um, on the COVID, I think our total spend, our total budget on COVID at the moment is, is 28.4 million, and we've got bids of another 1.1 million um, in, in this round. As I said, because it was um, allocated for the purposes intended, that's why it has to go back. But overall, we're not in an underspend position on our COVID, but I'm maybe let Louise give you a wee bit more detail on that specific one. So specifically, just in terms of courts, um, a lot of their funding for COVID came because they were anticipating a shortfall in their income due to a lot of the civil work not being um, taken forward this year. However, their income position has actually been higher than they had originally anticipated. So they have an easement in income. Now, that is 675,000. It's offset by additional costs that they're incurring in terms of um, estates, for example, additional accommodation, because again, of continued social distancing and so on, um, increased staff and security obviously for some of those, um, and then additional IT requirements. So the net position between their additional income and the additional costs is an easement then of 189,000. So again, because they're not making use of that money, as Deborah mentioned, we, we're returning that. No, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. That that does bring clarity to that. And I would appreciate if you could come back there on that on that other the tea book. And also the, the the language just is that a fair example of how those documents would be scripted at other times. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sinead. Robin, did you want to come back in at all? Uh, yes, Chair. I, I think I, I do agree with others who have spoken also on the tea book. Um, you know, I, I do think we do deserve an explanation as to why money was held for one project and then didn't go forward, and at what stage was it identified as not going forward, and was there enough time to reallocate? So, so I think there are some some questions with through you, Chair, should, should be uh, provided uh, for the for the committee. It was, Chair, my, my, I did lose my place. It was the. The Office of the Police Ombudsman, um, again, a not insignificant amount of funds, nearly half a million pounds being returned by the Police Ombudsman. That is a baseline, isn't it? I'm right that that's baseline area yeah. for it. Yeah. Uh, maybe, can you tell me why, why is that £430, sorry, four hundred. Four hundred thirty thousand pounds being returned, and is is there a, is there a regular amount being surrendered by by the police ombudsman's office? But this, this regular was amounts? specifically on their case management system. This was the capital project which has slipped, so that's why that's being given back. So it's not a regular amount of funding. Is a one-off for the police ombudsman? Okay, and it's just slippage in what are you? Sorry, did you say? Case management system. Case management system. So well, hold on a minute. Um, sorry. No, that's sorry. The case management system um, is this is the state pathology one, which is the half a million that's being surrendered on the capital. Are you referring to a different figure? Sorry. I, I'm like, referring to the four hundred and thirty thousand. Historical investigations. Yes. So again, this this is the one where, because of the um, the budget for twenty one twenty two being um, 
announced so late in, in, in the, at the end of the last financial year that delayed um, Oponi being able to move forward um, with recruiting of staff, etc. So that is why there was slippage on this. Okay. Uh, and you're saying this this is a baseline function for the department. Could that four hundred and thirty thousand not have been allocated somewhere else? But ease some <coughs> other pressures. So we have looked at all of our easements and we are going to be using our easements to meet pressures. We finished this round um, with one point seven million um, of the uh, of pressures and 1.2 of easements, um, and we will wait until we know the outcome of the October monitoring round and those bids of 25 million to then decide how we utilise that small amount of funding and then what decisions we will need to take around any other bids that are not met. So it will be used. Okay, so, so uh, and you're telling me that it's, there isn't a regular surrender of money by the Police Ombudsman's Office? Well, in the case of this particular one, there was previous um, easements, and that's just because of the delays in them getting the staff recruited. No, but you're telling me there isn't a regular surrender of money by the Police Ombudsman's Office? Well, it depends how, you de how, how we define regular. I would need to have a look back over what's happened in previous years. I don't have that information with me today, sorry. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Robin. Um, members, just uh, by way of winding up uh, that item, Firstly, I want to thank Deborah, um, Andrea and Louise for their time with us today um, and for answering our questions. I think we do have some questions in our pack that I think we will be sending off to yourselves just to get some written responses, just some of the questions that we didn't get through today probably. And I think on the, the back of the question and answer se uh, session there, um, I think we could add Peter's question around the modern slavery and the, the correlation between the, the spend and the underspend. Um, the, the court fees comparison in uh, different jurisdictions that, that Robin had raised um, and the TBOC, the specifics um, around the, that actual programme that Sinead had, had raised as well. So I think we could add those to our, our list of questions that we want to send um, to the department for a written response. Um, so if we're in agreement to do that, I'll, I'll thank the, the officials for their time today and I'll, I'll let you go. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, members. So, just uh, we'll we'll round up all of that. We have a note of all those questions, and we'll we'll send them off, and we'll try and get some answers for you in terms of the the questions that you've raised. Um, I think as well, it probably hasn't escaped our attention um, in the pack um, on the the proposed reductions for uh, in the budgets. Um, the two percent in twenty twenty two to twenty three, four percent twenty three to twenty four, and eight percent in twenty four to twenty five. Um, so I think it would be useful if the committee is in agreement um, if we write to those uh, non-departmental public bodies um, and just ask for their views on those proposed reductions um, and how it would impact them and so on. Because I think that would be useful for us as a committee just when we're assessing the 22 to 25 budget um, position, which I'm sure we'll do uh, in the next short while. So are members um, in agreement that we do that and also action those, um, those follow-up questions to the department? Great. Great. Okay, members, thank you. Okay, so listen, we'll move on to agenda item five, and that is the proposed strategy for supporting and challenging women, uh, supporting and challenging women and girls in contact with the justice system, um, and the results of the consultation and proposed next steps. So again, this is another oral evidence session, and um, we have department, uh, departmental officials attending the meeting today uh, via Starleaf, um, and they're going to just outline the results of the consultation and the proposed way forward um, in relation to the development of a strategy for supporting and challenging women and girls in contact with the justice system. So the relevant pages um, are at uh, 111 to 381 of your pack. And I just then welcome Stephen Laporte, who is the Deputy Director of Reducing Offending Division, Paula O'Neill, the Head of Reducing Offending Policy Unit, and well, that's all we have. We're <laughs> <laughs> so three people. There's somebody's hiding. Um, no, that's a... Duane. That's maybe ask Stephen. Sorry, yes, do we have Stephen. Is that Duane? Is, is that yourself? Yes, sorry. Duane. 
apology. Yeah, so we have Stephen McCourt and we have Joanne McPadden, policy official in the Reducing Offending Policy Unit at the Department of Justice. Um, so again, just to advise you guys that the, the session is going to be reported by Hansard and the transcript will be published on the committee webpage. So, um, Stephen and Joanne, you're very welcome. So can I just invite you now to give us just a, a brief outline of the key issues uh, that have arisen from the consultation and what the department's proposed way forward might be. So over to yourselves. Thank you, Chair, uh, for the introductions. And just for clarity, it's Joanne beside me here in Castle Villains. Uh, and Paul is on the separate screen. Um, we are pleased to be able to brief the committee on the outcome of the public consultation and um, proposed next steps for a justice-wide strategy for supporting and challenging women and girls in contact with the justice system. Every year there are a small number of women and girls who come in contact with the justice system because of their behaviour. We know that the impact of women and girls offending Coming into contact with the justice system and entering custody is significant and can have a long-lasting ripple effect, not only on victims but on the women and girls' families, future generations and society as a whole. We know from research and, more importantly, from the lived experience of women and girls that when they face the justice system, it is often at a time of crisis or when they are at their most vulnerable. A system that many consider is designed primarily for men and does not recognise or cater for their specific needs. We want to help and support women and girls to move away from offending at the earliest opportunity, de-escalating the criminal justice response where appropriate and adopting a more holistic approach. For these reasons, we wish to develop a specific strategy for women and girls in contact with the justice system. There has been extensive engagement on the strategy thus far, including ongoing discussions with the Strategy Development Group, which draws membership from the range of justice agencies and wider statutory partners that will be key to providing help and support beyond justice. I would like to spend a few moments updating you on engagement and the key issues that emerged from the public consultation on the proposed strategy. The public consultation ran for a period of eight weeks from 14 January to 12 March 2021. Responses were welcomed in a range of formats, including online through citizen space and through a consultation questionnaire that could be submitted electronically or in hard copy, as well as the full consultation document and easy read version was also produced to simplify the key points outlined in the more detailed document. Over 650 individuals and organisations were issued with links to the consultation. Key stakeholders were also offered the option of virtual consultation events and officials met with 26 organisations online in an individual and group setting. A number of organisations, in particular the Youth Justice Agency, NIACRO and the Turnaround Project, facilitated feedback from women and girls with a lived experience during the consultation period. Prisons have facilitated engagement with those in their care prior to the consultation. This engagement informed the consultation document and provided the policy team with significant insight into the women and girls' contact with the justice system. As you may have noted from your briefing paper, a total of 47 responses were ultimately received, with 26 of these providing answers to some or all of the consultation questions with varying degrees of detail. Eight responded to the easy read version, and the remaining responses were provided by either letter, email, and practitioner facilitated summaries. We were very pleased that there was generally overwhelming support for the development of a justice-wide strategy. It was viewed as presenting a significant opportunity to create and deliver meaningful and positive change. Some of the respondents qualified their support on the basis that the strategy is trauma-informed, rights-based, and that victims and the voice of victims are appropriately represented, views we would unreservedly agree with. In addition, both the consultation report and the briefing paper issued to the committee highlight a number of key issues raised by respondents to the consultation. Um, I'd just like to touch on a few of these. First, to successfully deliver a strategic coordinated approach to support and challenge women and girls, respondents considered that more detail is needed in regard to how the proposed priorities will translate into action. In line with the ethos of the proposed strategy, 
respondents recognise the need and vital role that preventative initiatives have in supporting women and girls. They also emphasise the need to ensure the strategy uses clear, consistent and trauma-informed language. Respondents considered that there is a need for a distinction between women and girls in the strategy and its delivery. They underline the need to provide age-appropriate services and interventions, with some recommending that young women aged 16 to 21 should be supported as young women who offend. In regard to supporting women and girls at an early stage and throughout their contact with the justice system, respondents promoted a cross-departmental approach with sustainable funding and resources that underpin delivery of the strategy. They also highlighted the role of and reliance on the voluntary and community sector. The potential role of mentors and peer support was also recognised. Respondents considered that those who have been in contact with the justice system should be involved in supporting women and girls with similar experiences. The importance of smooth, supported transitions into, through and out of the justice system featured throughout responses. The need for supported accommodation and accessible community support in rural areas was also highlighted. Finally, respondents expressed the need for urgent and immediate action to support women and girls in contact with the justice system, many offering their support to progress this important work. In taking forward on the development of this strategy, uh, supporting women and girls, we will need to take cognizance of these issues and ensure we engage with all relevant stakeholders as it progresses. This will include colleagues in the department, justice agencies and partners beyond the justice sphere and across sectors who are working on a range of areas which impact on this cohort. It is only by working together that we will make meaningful change and improve the life outcomes for women and girls and seek to address the harm caused. It remains our intention to adopt an approach that focuses on the range of contact with justice on what can be done to prevent and divert women and girls from crime supporting them to change in the community and helping improve their lives and circumstances on the occasion that they enter and leave custody. We want to build on the work that has come before. We see a new strategy as the next step in a growing, uh, growing a culture of openness, partnership and continuous improvement in this very important area of justice. I want to stress that this approach is not about giving women and girls an easier option or justice going soft on crime. It is about recognising that sometimes the most appropriate response is not about punitive or what might be considered traditional justice. It is about taking steps, taking a step back and asking what circumstances have brought this girl or woman in contact with the justice system, many of whom who have been the victims of crime themselves. Would an alternative approach that seeks to resolve some of the underlying issues be better for everyone? It is also importantly about women and girls taking responsibility for their actions and addressing the harm that has been caused by their behaviour. We are committed to delivering this strategy but recognise that this important piece of work will be delivered in the context of wider competing challenges and pressures. We also understand that the impact of the global pandemic will undoubtedly exacerbate the vulnerabilities and trauma faced by many of the women and girls that come into contact with the justice system. It is our intention to finalise a women and girls strategy and associated action plan over the coming months, and these will be subject to ministerial and justice committee consideration in due course. Chair, we're happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Stephen, and apologies to Paula O'Neill. Um, I didn't formally introduce you at the start of the meeting because um, I couldn't see you on the screen. So we have Paula O'Neill, um, the Head of Reducing Offending Policy Unit, with us as well. So you're very welcome too, Paula. Um, yeah, again, thanks very much for that, Stephen. I have just a couple of questions, and then I'm going to throw it open to members. Um, so just you'd indicated there that you know there is a time, the time scale for producing the draft strategy may be in um, the coming months. Are you able at all to be sort of more specific about that? Um, and give us some indication of when we might, you know, we, we might see something concrete coming before us. Uh, Chair, we'll, we have a strategy development group that is working in relation to finalising the strategy at this point in time. They have considered and are considering at this point in time the summary of responses, and we have it as an intention to have the strategy completed 
in this financial year, so by March next year, the strategy should be ready for publication. Okay, that's good news. Um, you see, just on the so, so I just sort of have an issue with the term women and girls because it's it's very broad. Um, that's a really broad cohort of people. If you just say women and girls, and I think you know, if, if we're to put in place effective interventions, I think you have to drill down into that um, a wee bit more acutely. Um, you you touched on the fact that you could have older or, or younger women uh, and girls, but you know you also can break break that down into. You know, ethnic background. Um, we have new nationals. We might have women and girls that are parents, or maybe have par current responsibilities. Um, so, and all, uh, the urban-rural divide as well. So, I'm just, you know, my question would be, how do you incorporate all those varying um, needs into, um, you know, a single strategy? And, you know, are there plans to sort of break it down more, you know, you know, more succinctly into those different. Um, those different groups, because I think just women and girls is very broad. It's very open to interpretation. No, you make a very valid point, and certainly something that was outlined in relation to the consultation. Um, you know, because we are looking at a spectrum here from the minimum age of criminal responsibility, which is currently ten, all the way through to uh, adult uh, women within within the custody system. So. What we're trying to do in relation to the strategy is, is focusing in relation to those various different age spectrums in relation to understanding what both works for women and girls. Uh, and it's something in relation to in particular women when it was mentioned in the consultation in terms of what, uh, what works in relation to looking at young women between the ages of uh, 16 to 21 or 18 to 21. It is something that, that we will have to take back to the strategy development group in particular in relation to have a focused piece of work to see what works uh, in relation to those those various, you know, the age spectrum that we're looking at. One of the things I would say, um, I'll invite Joanne and Paula to, to comment on from, from their experience in relation to the consultation and the engagement that they have. One of the things would be that just because we, we need to be age specific because what works for uh, young girls in relation to the ju youth justice system will not be appropriate in relation to young women even in relation to the adult system so it has to be very much gender specific in terms of her approach and very much focused in relation to being age specific as well uh, as you mentioned Joanne. Yes, yeah, yeah. so I was just going to say we also do need to, to a certain extent, take a broader view in that women and girls generally have gender specific needs that should be addressed. So, for example, if we're looking at um, any sort of interventions, whenever we look at women and girls in contact with the justice system, they're often uh, it's important for them to make real and lasting connections and relationships with individuals and having, let's say, a, a key support worker to work with them works better than than it might for men and boys. Also, we're, we're cognizant of, depending on the age and depending on backgrounds, offending patterns and uh, different profiles can be different. So we, we're mindful that there will need to be different approaches. I would also say any actions that we do come out of or do come out of the, the strategy will also be a quality impact screen. So and um, all the groups that you actually mentioned will will be assessed against each of the actions and see what sort of mitigating action needs to be taken and needs to address, for example, women in rural communities or women from the BME from a BME background because uh, we're mindful that they may be able to need to access. Uh, services in a slightly different way. Yep. No, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, just one more, and then I'm going to pass it over to um, to members. I know there was a view um, from the respondents that they weren't overly fussed on the, the general messaging, or maybe even the title. Um, I think they're probably referring to the words, maybe terms like challenging and, and manage, managing. So, has there been any thought, maybe, to to change in those words or tinkering about with the the actual title of the, the strategy itself? Yes, I think, I, I think if you don't mind, Chair, I'll, I'll pick up on that one. Uh, we had uh, the words empowering and challenging were both in the title. I also was sharing with Stephen just before we come in that we actually did flag uh, that at the pre-consultation stage there was concerns about it and we actually featured that in the consultation. 
So I think we would be looking to revisit the title and consider um, how it could be more trauma informed because I know that was some concerns that some respondents had and also they considered that empowering didn't necessarily take on the social constructs that often influence female offending and you know that um, wider work had to be done by the department as well as the women themselves to support them changing behaviour. Um, one thing just to add Chair, the, the, the aspect as well we also have to take into consideration is that, that in the use of the word challenge um, we also have to think about the voice of the victim uh, in relation to the work that we're doing and that's something we always have to bear, bear in mind in relation to it may be appropriate in certain circumstances that uh, it would be necessary in relation to the interventions to be challenging in relation to looking at uh, an individual in terms of you know supporting them in relation to turning um, their lives around but what it is as Joanne rightly says um, a difficult one whenever we're looking at a trauma-informed approach and certainly it is one that we're more than happy to reflect again in relation to the appropriate terminology that we can use to make sure it is consistent with the needs of the women uh, and girls that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Yep, no, agree with that, thank you. <coughs> um, okay, so I've got Sinead and then Peter. Go ahead Sinead. Thank you, Chair, and thank you uh, to the officials attending. I do think it's important that there is real clarity about the the age reach of this strategy um, in terms of who it covered, because particularly because of our extremely low age of criminal responsibility. Um, so I, I would like to see the format of that, I suppose, more clearly or proposed, because it will have to be broken down by age. Um, because, as you said, there may be some common threads between girls and women, but there are wider differences as well in their needs. And um, I would like to also, one of the things that jumped out at me was um, there was concern to express 73% of women had physical or mental health conditions and 36% showing signs of self-harm at time of, uh, for their detention. And I, I was taken aback by that number, but only because I also am aware that uh, people who have a personality disorder are not classified, I understand, as having a mental health condition. And yet there's lots of evidence coming um, from prisons that, that this is a, a real problem in terms of the daily management. So those figures um, are quite startling. And I would ask um, what effort will the, this strategy have to take that into account and to tailor particularly for that group? In any way, um, I'd also like to ask the there was reference made uh, by uh, by research taken out by Shona Minson on the um, the rights of the child and maternal sentencing and the Palgrave. And I have learned of some really harrowing stories where um, a mother who is serving quite a long sentence had a a good relationship with her son and was doing homeworks every evening. Um, remotely with him and keeping that relationship alive and it was certainly a win-win from everybody's reading of the situation and the young boy um, apparently doing very well for himself and suddenly that was removed and the effect on the mother was obvious to see but the effect on the child um, could not even be measured and I, I really think this is an opportunity to, to look at those things and will um, consideration be given to the rights of the child um, whose mother may, may be the, the person in prison. And also I'd just like to follow up on then the, the community piece. Um, what is the follow on for women and girls, you know, if, if they have been detained and there's a follow on piece, who follows them and, and checks their welfare and that they are integrating? And if there is real ambition from this strategy, um, is there a bid for funding to support it? Because like many strategies, unless it's properly funded, um, it's, it's likely to not hit the mark. I appreciate I've thrown a lot at you there, so thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair, and, and forgive me if, if I missed some of them, but I'll, I'll try to cover most of what uh, the queries. Um, in terms of the mental health provision, um, you're quite right in relation to say that in relation to mental health provision uh, and individuals who 
uh, are within custody, that there is a significant, uh, you know, a significant tendency in relation to mental health. So in terms of the strategy, um, we are tied into wider strategies in relation to support mechanisms in terms of the mental health strategy in general. Um, and there will be that cross-executive support in relation to addressing the mental health needs. And indeed, we're working quite closely with the mental health champion in relation to supporting people to see how we can improve the provision in relation to mental health for women and indeed men within a custodial context. Um, certainly, mental health provision, you know, obviously, uh, we work with both the statutory sector and in relation to the wider voluntary and community sector across a range of services in relation to addressing mental health need. Uh, you know, obviously Southeastern Health and Social Care Trust and indeed in relation to action mental health, uh, in relation to supporting people uh, within the prison service care. Um, in terms of uh, contact between mothers uh, and their children, Certainly within the family strategy in terms of the Northern Ireland Prison Service family strategy is one of the important areas in relation to trying to maintain as much as we reasonably can in relation to supporting young people um, in relation to their continued contact with, particularly in relation to mothers who may be in custody and it is quite rightly, as you say, a very important aspect that we need to maintain uh, moving forward. Um, it is something that we will be looking at in relation to the strategy in terms of how we can improve provision in relation to that area uh, for all the reasons that, that you have outlined. Um, and it is in terms of the action plan, in terms of the family strategy, one of the aspects that, that we will be trying to improve going forward. Um, obviously, in terms of where we are at with COVID at the moment, that has impacted in relation to contact and the level of contact that the prison service have tried to maintain in terms of of people in our care and indeed in relation to their family circumstances. Um, we have a number of areas that we have seek to put in place in relation to improve it, in, in, indeed in relation to virtual provision, which has assisted particularly in area, areas of this, but, but you know, having direct contact between a child and the parent obviously is the ideal situation in terms of visitation or indeed in relation to allowing them access and more frequent access to support them at times, including uh, whenever they are doing homeworks, etc. Um, just in relation to the rights of the child, one of the things that you're quite right in terms of uh, looking at is how we can incorporate uh, the rights of the child in terms of uh, those rights and the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission were very clear in terms of looking in terms of the consultation document and the strategy, strategy to see how we can make sure that we accurately uh, and fully adopt the rights of the child moving forward. Um, just I was just going to add to those two points, just the first around mental health. And that would be that you probably note from your briefing paper and the uh, report that you had, uh, we had an innovation lab where we had a, a, a breadth of uh, stakeholders and there is absolutely um, no um, surprise to the fact that whenever they consider custody, one of the first priorities which does feature is looking at scoping and reviewing and improving mental health services and support that's available for those in custody. And um, I think, as you mentioned, personality disorder, there's also the fact that we have women and girls also who have experienced um, a history of trauma, and that trauma does not necessarily naturally fit into a particular area where mental health services can tap into. So we're mindful that, that, that um, you know, we need to be looking at how we can support those individuals um, in custody and also whenever they um, are going out into the community and um, also whenever Stephen had mentioned there about children and families, I know there was some shocking um, information in the reports that Shona Minson did around the impact on children of, for example, the, the pandemic and what, it had, what impact it had on visits and children's visits. So we're very mindful of that. And I think if you look at the priorities in the family strategy, there's a priority around making sure that visits are done at a time and in a way that can support children actually spending time because sometimes the time isn't ideal. 
and as far as I'm aware there still is um, there's ongoing initiatives across the different establishments around um, bedtime reading and around homework, home, doing homework. So um, I do think virtual, virtual visits has brought quite a few benefits, but obviously we're aware of the impact of the lack of face-to-face -face visits up until more recently has had on children and young people being able to uh, see and speak to their parents and particularly their mothers. Chair, do you mind if I also add to um, the member's point on mental health provision? Uh, it's just to um, just to state that on our strategy development group, the Department of Health is a member of that. Um, several officials from the department sit on that group. Um, and given that South Eastern Trust provide health provision within the prison setting, and that's a very important connection for us. So we have been working with health officials to date in relation to the development of the consultation, and we'll continue to engage with them on matters such as health, physical health and mental health. Thank you. And Chair, through yourself, if I may just come back on that, I think that's a valid point in terms of the um, also the you know, personality disorders, but also trauma. And I know certainly um, members in this committee will know with the domestic abuse bill and course of control and human trafficking, we've seen you know, all those other effects that, um, that are part of the cocktail, if you like, that can be uh, a reason for a woman ending up um, in prison. But I, I do take that point and, and I would press on the, the final point then about the funding, you know, and um, that the strategy would be properly funded. But thank you um, to the panel for your time. Thank you and for your answers. Thank you, Sinead. Um, so we'll have Peter and then Robin. Thank you. Thank you, um, folks, so far for the the information you've given us, I suppose we're at a particular stage in relation to this, we're not at the, the end point. Uh, and it does strike me that, that um, it's fairly clear that not simply the substance of this is, is critically important, but also, as we've seen around a couple of the, the areas we've already touched on, um, the importance, the delicacy of the correct terminology, the correct language. And I know the Chair has raised the point about whether particular terms are appropriate and we can debate as well about um, the limitations in terms of women and girls or, or whatever way anything is, is phrased. I suppose to some extent I, I appreciate there's very clearly been uh, within this uh, an attempt to try and be sensitive and delicate in terms of language because I suppose getting the language wrong in one direction or another can lead to unfortunate levels of either offence or concern that, that's been raised. Uh, I suppose the one downside sometimes that can lead then to a little bit of confusion or lack of clarity of what the, the objectives are at times. Can I ask, obviously, as the focus of this strategy is essentially on female either offenders or those at risk of offending, I think, with the very appropriate and worthy aim of trying also to either prevent offending from occurring or for those who have been involved in offending to take them uh, out of that, that pathway of, of offending. Um, can I just ask, I think there is a corresponding though linkage, um, while it will be different services, different approaches, different strategies there, if we're looking effectively at female offenders, female potential offenders, those are supposed to use the phrase that are in contact with the um, judicial system, also from a female perspective, can be female victims or they can be female witnesses uh, of crime. And obviously, those are not probably particularly the, the focus of this particular strategy. But I wonder just if you could outline what level of coordination and read across with the provision of services for those who are uh, female victims, female witnesses of crime. Because I'm conscious, I think, that, that for this strategy to succeed, not only will everything need to be got right within the strategy, but also we need to see a level of public buy in to whatever the strategy is there to make sure, for instance, that it's given the level of prioritisation. And I just see a slight degree of danger, but because I suppose we're at this stage not seeing what the final strategy is, that if there is too much of a direct disjoint between a knowledge of what is being provided and what is being done in terms of interventions for female offenders, for instance, compared to direct victims of crime, um, it does risk a possibility that if it's seen that the provision of services is at a higher level and, and level of support for offenders compared to victims could lead, I think, to a level of either public misunderstanding or a level of concern that's raised that, 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 for instance, female victims of crime or those also involved with the criminal justice system are not being given the level of support 
that is at least corresponding with those who are, are offenders in relation to that. And while I think some of the services said would, would be different between the two, clearly, I'm just asking what level of coordination or read across there is between those different sections of females that, that are, to use the phrase, in direct contact with the, the criminal justice system. Uh, thank you, Chair. No, uh, you make absolutely valid points in relation to, to the, the, uh, the issue you have raised. And indeed, in terms just from the victim's perspective, one of the things coming out of the consultation um, was the importance of making sure that the victim's voice is front and centre in relation to the strategy. And indeed, we will be moving to include victim support within the strategy development group. Uh, moving forward, although we, we keep in very close contact and consulted them quite closely in relation to it, but we think it is important, you know, that they be specifically included to ensure that the victim's voice um, is is heard. But, but you're also quite right, you know, in indicating that if you look at poverty, child caring responsibilities, pregnancy, complex childhood trauma, and experiences of domestic and sexual violence. Um, all of those are among the needs of many women who have offended. Um, and indeed, you know, the importance that, that we're looking at in terms of gender specific diversion, looking at pre trial options, looking at alternatives to imprisonment, um, that also needs to be factored against respect for the rule of law and the rights of victims, as you point out. And that all has to be central to the kind of gender responsive approach that we're seeking to achieve, not only through this strategy, but also in relation to a number of other elements that we're bringing forward in terms of wider work through the department. Um, if you're looking at the review of the INSPIRE model for PBNI, in terms of the approach and how it will dovetail with the strategy moving forward, or indeed in relation to looking at the work um, that we're currently working on in relation to a progressive youth justice system, uh, and in terms of a child first approach in relation to that. So all of those aspects taken together, you know, is a balancing act in relation to not only looking at offending behaviour, but also in relation in relation to the fact that many of the women themselves have been the victims uh, of some very significant trauma in relation to their lives and how we balance that out moving forward is important. Sorry, I was, uh, Chair, I was just going to add to that and the one thing I think is important around this strategy is we are focusing as much as we can around prevention and diversion, which in, in pure economic terms is less costly than having supporting women in custody at a later stage. So, you know, we, we recognise that although there may be investment needed initially if we're talking about prevention and diversion, that down the line we could potentially realise benefits. And we also are mindful that whenever we're putting bids forward, we are essentially going to have to prioritise as a department across the board. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Robin and then Rachel. Thank you very much, Chair. And again, welcome the, the uh, delegates to the committee. Thank you for your attendance. Just a couple of simple questions, I think. Um, it was in terms of the um, consultation process, it was a eight weeks consultation process and 47 returns, 31 from organisations and 16 from private individuals. Is that sufficient, do you think, to, or are there any gaps in there that you might have expected returns from? Um, well, as well as what, well, certainly what you, you, you cite as responses, um, we have also undertaken, as Joanne alluded to earlier, innovation labs in relation to bringing people together. Um, and both Joanne and Paula also spent nearly a week uh, in Ash House in High Bankwood uh, interviewing uh, about 50 females uh, who have been dr obviously directly affected in relation to the to, uh, you know, the uh, custodial system. Yeah. So certainly from, from our perspective, we think the responses has been been uh, quite broad. Um, we have very much welcomed the interaction that we have had, both from the voluntary and community sector and other organisations in the 26th that, that we allude to, and Joanne can perhaps give you some indication of 
the breadth of those organisations that responded. But at this point in time, um, aside from the, the direct, uh, once we have consulted with victim support, but we feel that they need to be front and centre in relation to the strategy development, and as I say, we'll bring them in. We don't see any other significant gaps at the present. No, I was just going to say we, we had thought eight weeks was an appropriate um, amount of time, but anybody that, uh, that wanted an extension was granted one because we wanted to make sure we got a balanced view from uh, organisations. So as, as Stephen had mentioned, we had uh, the housing executive responded, we had the police responded, the Simon community, the Royal College of Speech and Language. So, um, victim support, women's aid. So those, there was a breadth of response, responses that reflected both um, women and girls uh, who maybe have a, who su supporting women and girls who had offended or maybe were in the cusp of offending, but also supporting individuals who have been victims potentially of um, that offending. Also, what I would say is of, that there was an extensive amount of pre-consultation. For example, we sent um, letters out to key stakeholders with a broad framework of what we wanted to put in the consultation document and key priorities. And why I mention that is, for example, at that stage, we got a response and had meetings with the safeguarding board, for example, who didn't provide a formal response, but we have very much captured and are aware of the information they had suggested. So, um, also, around the consultation. It was done at around about the time, as far as I know, it was maybe the mental health strategy, so went down at the same time. So I think there was probably a range of organisations that had a number of consultations that they were interested in responding to. But I do think we've got a pretty good picture from respondents um, giving a, a wide range of views. So that, that's... Chair, do mind? I'm, I'm sorry, um, I'm still going to come in with an additional point, but happy for the member to continue. Okay, sorry, Chair. I mean, it wasn't a criticism, it was a question I was asking about the, 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 the breadth, breadth of. It, it just, just it jumped out at me that, uh, and you've mentioned the speech and therapy uh, from the South Eastern Health and Social Care Trust. Am I right in thinking that they're the only branch of the South Eastern who replied? But none of the other trusts had an official response to it. Am I right in that? Sorry, are you are you the, the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapy? Yes. No, that 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 is um, that's not um, associated with the trust. That's just the college. Um, the South Eastern Trust essentially facilitated a workshop with women in in um, High Bank Wood. And also, all of the trusts would have uh, been issued with letters. However, as Paula had mentioned earlier, because the department actually sits on the the group, they would also have the opportunity to filter in um, any comment or any information through the strategy um, development group. Okay, that's that's grand. In terms of the, uh, I mean, I have to say, I think the the uh, priorities to be translated into action. I think. That's a very comprehensive list. I came down to the very last one, and the need for urgent and immediate action to support women and girls. And then I, I tried to find what the next steps were recommending within the report, but I couldn't quite find those. Maybe I'm sure that's my fault, but maybe you could outline what the next steps are. Uh, certainly, Chair. Um, well, in relate, it, it's not your fault. Um, I can assure you it's because it, it's not there um, in terms of the documentation in relation to looking at you know what we would class as urgent and immediate. But that's one of the things that will be taken back in relation to looking within the strategy development group in terms of those actions that we consider that we can meet uh, in a very, very short time scale and that would be having the most significant benefit in relation to, to not only uh, girls within the uh, the criminal justice system, but also uh, women within a custodial setting and indeed in relation to the community. So, Chair, that's something that we'll be looking at in terms of prioritisation in relation to the action plan moving forward. Okay. 
And as I was just going to add, Cherry, yes, you, you actually, if you blink, you might have missed it, because next steps is literally paragraph 5.7 or 5.3 to 5.7, which is really, as Stephen had said, the fact that there's lots of issues we need to consider and that the strategy coming out of it will be more detailed and more uh, identify more deliverables. OK, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, no, I think you understand your question in terms of the consultation response, because when we were both members of the Communities Committee, we had this issue in terms of the licensing bill. So, and it was, I know there's varying degrees of, of uptake in terms of different consultations, so that's, that's a fair enough question. Um, Rachel, do you want to go ahead? Thank you, uh, Tara. Thank you for your presentation and the, um, for the documents. I mean, a lot of it's been covered already. So I'm just wanting to know um, if uh, a couple of points, is there any sort of in, in the strategy, obviously you'd be developing a final strategy. Is there anything at this stage though that has come through that will require primary legislation? Uh, certainly there, there may be aspects in relation to the work that we're looking at that may or may not require legislation. Um, there's nothing at the moment that jumps out at me that that may require primary legislation. Okay, no, that's um, that's good to know. Which is, I know they. Um it's, there's a lot of things in it which has come up in the, in the consultation, like improved data collection. That's something that um, we committees discussed um, before, and it's um, and it's publication. And also, it's not the first time that I've heard about um, uncertainty on pre-sentencing reports. You know, and understanding, um, and what if you know what if any mitigating circumstances were taken into account in that kind of you know thing that came through in the consultation. And again, uh, you know that sort of thing. Is that not something that could be done now rather than having to wait for it possibly being included in a finalized strategy? Do you know if that's a more of a process thing rather than a than, than needing say needing to be in a strategy if it's it's if it's about communication and information sharing? Absolutely. Um I couldn't agree more, Chair, in terms of, of of the comment. If there are easy wins as such that we can take forward without having to wait for the completion of the strategy, we, we will do so, uh, and that's particularly one area. Just, just reflecting in relation to your earlier question, there is the possibility in terms of legislation that may or may not impact in terms of looking at a restorative justice approach uh, in relation to, in particular, but that would be not necessarily gender specific, but more more wider incorporating both men and women. Um, and that's something we're looking at in the context of the wider adult restorative justice strategy. Some of the elements coming out of that may point towards legislation and certainly uh, from Judge Moran and in his hate crime review and indeed Judge Gillen pointed to two aspects that may or may not lead to legislation. So it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that there will there may be necessary for legislation that will also benefit in relation to this particular strategy, but it's not specific to it, if you know what I mean. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, obviously, the, I think there, even with restorative justice, it was things that were supposed to be legislated for by the end of this mandate that have been removed from the justice bill in, in relation to restorative practice and restorative justice. So certainly um, that kind of uh, legislation has obviously been very important, but um, sadly will not be hitting um, the Assembly Chamber in this uh, mandate. Um, I suppose just uh, and in terms of a strategy then, the Violence Against Women and Girls strategy is something that um, the committees dealt with, we discussed before, I tried to amend the domestic abuse bill to no avail on it, and it's something that the Assembly has now called for. Um, I know that that is with TEO, um, but in terms of tying in this kind of strategy, uh, would there be an intention then of, of kind of, of of joining, you know, joining in and, and, and engaging then with the executive office on in any violence against women and girls strategy? Because we can see the the parallels, um, especially with the consultation responses. And certainly in relation to the work that we're engaged in in terms of of this strategy, if if there is a requirement in terms of of engaging with TEO. Um, you know, we will take that forward in relation to any lessons learned both in relation to our consultation, but in the wider uh, piece of work in relation to violence against women and girls, um, because uh, throughout the justice system in relation to membership of our particular strategy development group, um, colleagues in relation to domestic violence 
uh, sit on it so they, they have a particular, uh, let's say, interest in relation to that wider violence against women and girls strategy uh, in terms of its development and taking it forward. So lessons will be learned and shared across the piece. J just in terms of touching on your point in relation to the impact of the provision in terms of the clause and restorative justice being removed from the miscellaneous provisions bill. Um, there is a workaround in relation to that that we have in terms of agency arrangements in place with the Secretary of State to allow the Minister of Justice to accredit organisations so it isn't that, that it will uh, in the short term cause difficulty but in the long term obviously we wish to rectify the overall provision. No, thank you, and uh, you have missed support there on that one. Um, I suppose a bit of a, a, maybe this has been considered or maybe it hasn't, um, but this is um, sort of tying in uh, with the uh, Ministry of Justice in 2018. Um, they published a female offender strategy, and it stated that there's persuasive evidence that short custodial sentences are less effective in reducing reoffending than community orders. So I'm wondering if the department have looked at that, or is that something that um, would be looking for in the in, in coming forward? It, certainly, in relation to looking at short custodial sentences, whether it be for women or men. We have the same problem in relation to uh, the impact that that somebody's time within a custodial setting can benefit from when they are in a short custodial setting. Uh, sentence in particular, not least to the fact that the time spent in remand counts against that, and we have even less time unless somebody within custody wishes to engage in intervention programs or whatever. It is something that we are looking at to see how that we can not only look at various programs that we can, uh, let's say, deliver uh, to cater for people that are on short sentences, but also learn lessons in relation to um, other jurisdictions in terms of what can be done both within a custodial setting and in the community in relation to the through the gate piece. Um, because one of the things you'll notice in relation to the consultation document was the importance in relation to looking at that through the gate support, uh, particularly for women and girls. Um, and that that's something that, that in particular we're, we are looking to see how we can work across the executive with all our departmental colleagues uh, to see how we can connect to services in a more timely way in the community for people moving out of uh, custody. Uh, in terms of meeting their needs within a community context in the post-custodial environment. Um, we know from our statistics that um, people are most vulnerable in relation to release from custody on a three to four month period. Um, and that's, that's something in particular that works not only for women but, but men as well. And it's something we're trying to focus on to see what we can do to address that particular period of time in terms of reoffending, because the reoffending rate tends to go up and then comes down after that that critical period in legal custody. So it is an important area for us. Um, Thank you. And my, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, Chair. I was just also going to add. Um, you know, whenever we're talking about women and girls here who are coming in in short sentences, they often present with complex needs that can't necessarily be addressed within that short sentence. So I think it's also important for us to consider around tapping into like the substance use strategy, the mental health strategy, to uh, realize significant benef benefits where they are supported in the community and indeed transition into the community. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, 100%. Um, I suppose one um, final point from me there is um, about um, it was something that very, very sadly happened, um, and it was in a report from the prison and probation ombudsman in England. It came out um, September this year. It's investigating the death of a newborn baby in prison in 2019. And the mother was 18 years old and was on remand for a robbery. And despite repeated calls for help, she gave birth alone in her cell. And there's now calls uh, for an end to the imprisonment of pregnant women from a number of organizations. And there's been a lot of research uh, coming out of Coventry University, um, which sheds a wee bit more light on this issue and highlighting countries do not imprison impre uh, pregnant women um, or severely restrict their incarceration, it includes Brazil and Russia and Ukraine. So I'm just wondering if this is something that the department have looked at before 
um, or if this has come across and um, do you see this issue being part of the forthcoming strategy? Yeah, and cer certainly, um, Chair, we know that, you know, the tragic circumstances in relation to, to um, that's just been outlined, it, it's just horrific. Um, and certainly we know that, that there, obviously there is an interest to see um, how many women have given birth while serving in prison in Northern Ireland over the last 10 years, and the answer to that is six. Um, and there hasn't been anybody who's given birth inside prison premises uh, over that period of time. All, all uh, uh, you know, the women in question have been catered for within a hospital context. Um, the, the prison service in relation to have various practice standards in relation to look, looking at how they address the needs of women in care and certainly um, in terms of the most recent Sijini report um, in relation to Ash House particularly commented in a number of important recommendations in relation to how they could improve service um, and certainly we can come back to the committee in terms of where those recommendations currently stand um, but we know in terms of uh, current provision that in those circumstances uh, that individuals are uh, within residential setting, within the wider healthcare setting within the prison and not within the normal, let's say, residential units uh, within uh, High Bank Wood. Uh, one of the things, and quite rightly, that has been said is that this is one of the areas that, that we wish to look at. Uh, in terms of circumstances and one of the things that in order to do so um, that we wish to focus on is about alternatives to custody um, because it is important in relation to looking at particular circumstances um, through whether it be through uh, information that's provided through pre-sentence reports or whatever that if there is an alternative to custody that that should be available in relation to the judiciary to allow them to make an informed decision uh, in terms of whether it be remand or indeed the provision of a custodial sentence. Um, and that's certainly something we wish to look at. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for giving me the answer to my AQW. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Rachel. Um, okay, members, nobody else has indicated. So um, we'll draw that to a close there. So I, I think it's really good that, first of all, that we have strong support for a new strategy. Um, so I think this committee will definitely be looking forward to um, the, you know, the considering, uh, considering, considering the, uh, the action plan and any draft strategy that comes before us um, in the next short while. So can I just thank Stephen and Paula and um, Joanne for your time today. Um, it's been really useful, so I'll, I'll let you go. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, okay, thank you for that. So, just on the back of that, um, can I just inform members that, uh, subject to any comments from this committee, the department intends to publish the consultation responses uh, on the departmental website in the next short weeks. Um, the department has also indicated that the views expressed and issues raised in the consultation responses will inform the development of a draft strategy and associated action plan. And these will also need to take account of the findings and recommendations of the ongoing uh, criminal justice inspection on how the criminal justice system treats females in conflict with the law and that's likely to be published in the coming months and um, the update, updated draft strategy and associated action plan will be subject to ministerial and justice committee uh, consideration in due course so members that is just for noting at this stage unless anybody you know feel strongly about uh, submitting any additional views or comments to the, to the department at this stage? Are we happy to wait for the draft strategy to come before us on the action plan? Yep, okay, yep. thank you. Okay, members, thanks for that. We'll move on to agenda item six, and that is the damages return on investment bill and the summary of the committee's informal deliberation. So you'll find information relating to this at uh, pages 26 to 30 of your table pack. Um, and that outlines the position in relation to the clauses and schedule of the damages bill at a number of other issues following our in, uh, informal deliberations last week. Uh, the committee agreed that it was content with the provisions of the bill and did not wish to bring forward any amendments at this stage. While content with the schedule as drafted, members did indicate that the provision of the 0.5 of a percentage point further margin of error in uh, paragraph 10 may be something they would want to come back to. 
Members also indicated that they may wish to give further consideration to the issues relating to periodical uh, payment orders. Um, so, members, for your information, the committee will undertake its formal clause by clause consideration um, of the bill at our meeting on the 7th of October. Um, the department has been asked to review the hazard of our discussion in relation to PPOs <coughs> and provide any further information or clarification um, on the process relating to PPOs and the issues discussed that may be helpful to the committee before our meeting on the 7th of October. So, um, members, can I ask you just to note that position with regard to the damages bill, unless there's any other issues members want to raise at this time? Great. Great. Oh, no? Oh, great. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to agenda item seven, um, the Civil Jurisdiction and Judgments 2005 Hay Convention and 2007 Hay Convention Amendment Regulations 2022. And this is the pages 384 to 392 of your um, meeting pack. Um, so, members, the Minister of Justice has consented to the extension to Northern Ireland of the Civil Jurisdiction and Judgments um, 2005 Hay Convention and 2007 Hay Convention Amendment Regulations 2022. The Department has indicated that the regulations, which were made under Section 2 of the Private International Law Implementation of Agreements Act 2020, and are subject to the draft affirmative parliamentary procedure, are highly technical and amend the UK-wide legislation. The 2020 Act now implements uh, domestically the, 20, or sorry, the 2005 Hague Convention on Choice of Court Agreements and the 2007 Hague Convention on the International Recovery of Child Support and Other Forms of Family Maintenance. The regulation set out the text of the conventions and the UK's reservations and declarations as new schedules to the Civil Jurisdictions and Judgments Act uh, 1982. They do not amend the implementation of the conventions or change the reservations or declarations. Um, so just to re uh, remind members that the committee agreed to support the Minister of Justice in seeking the Assembly's endorsement of a legislative consent motion relating to provisions in the 2020 Act and the committee's deliberations on the matter were set out in a report on the LCM, which is included at pages 386 to 392 of the meeting pack. So um, at this stage, members are just being asked to note the position regarding the extension to Northern Ireland of the Civil Jurisdiction and Judgments 2005 and 2007 Hague Convention Amendment Regulations um, 2000, I think that's 2002, 2022 <laughs> type of. Um, unless they wish to make any comments or require any further information or clarification. And if you all understood that, then fair <laughs> play um, So I take it there's no, no comments at this stage, okay? So we'll, we'll note that item. Um, so members, we'll move on to agenda item eight. <laughs> Uh, the domestic abuse offence training and awareness materials um, and this is an update for us um, members you'll find the information relating to this at 394 to 402 of your pack so the department has provided an update on the training and awareness materials being developed in preparation for the new domestic abuse offence coming into op uh, operation in late february 2022 uh, the update covers an e-learning training package targeted towards frontline public sector professionals who may come into contact with the victim or abuser during the course of their duties, the PSNI training plan, the PPS training plan, a multimedia public awareness campaign, a digital awareness tool to complement the e-learning and public awareness campaign, and a public-facing infographic, which will be shared with the committee when finalised. The department is also offered to provide a further update in the new year if the committee would find that helpful. So, members, we're asking you to note the update um, and if the members are agreeable, um, can we schedule a further update in the new year, um, unless any other members require clarification or, or information in the meantime? Are we happy to receive that in the new year? Great. Yep. Great. Chair, could I seek some clarification, please? Of course, go ahead. Um, it's regarding the PSNI. Uh, please, firstly, I really want to welcome this update. It is good to, to keep um, on top of what's happening. But in terms of the PSNI training on this, I'd just be keen to know who actually is charged with uh, developing this training programme. And I also note on the list, I think they're using a link, like an internal infrastructure um, to include people. And there are some obvious people or organisations missing from that system. And um, off the top of my head, I noticed the Commissioner for Older People, and I think there can be 
um, some stereotypes around this sort of um, crime and older people are as vulnerable to it, sadly, as, as everyone else. So um, just to, to find out, are there plans to extend who will have access to that link system? I don't know why uh, the Commissioner for Older People isn't in the system, but um, maybe for good reason. But I wondered, are there, uh, is there going to be, uh, uh, I suppose, a sweeping assessment of who may have been left out in terms of getting access to this? Thank you. Thank you, Sinead, and we've taken a note of that, so we'll, we'll attempt to get the clarification on those questions for you um, as soon as possible. I've lost the screen, but I think, Rachel, you have your hand up there as well. Yeah, yes, thanks, Chair. Um, the, just to say, the All-Party Group on Domestic Abuse got a preview of the e-learning training package a couple of weeks ago, and it was brilliant. It's, it's really, really good, and um, thanks to Veronica and uh, the team for the demonstration. But um, in terms, Sinead's question is something that was raised and it's to do with technology access, but there was going to be a link sent out, but I can't for the life of remember me exactly what it was. There was like a, a, di a different package, so there is something, but absolutely would welcome that clarity just for my own head too. Um, and I know we couldn't put it onto the face of the bill, um, uh, but I wonder if there's any information on what information is being made available for the judiciary through the Judicial Studies Board. Um, on this new offence and particularly as well with the lay magistrate um, and those that would be dealing with, say, with the family courts, um, just in, if there is any, uh, any information available on what new information has been given then. Okay, Rachel, yeah, that's all very valid. Um, again, yeah, we'll take note of those. Are we, I presume, Sinead and Rachel, you'd want this before the briefing in the new year, this information, we get it as, as soon as we can. So we were, we're prepared for the next briefing. Yep. If possible. If possible. Yep. Yeah. Okay, no problem. We'll definitely attempt to do that. Um, okay, thank you, members. Um, okay, if we move on to agenda item nine, which is the implementation of the re recommendations of the Gillen Review into Serious Sexual Offences in Northern Ireland. Um, and again, this is an update for us, so you'll find this at pages 404 to 471 of your meeting pack. Um, so just to remind members that the committee considered a written update on the progress to deliver the implementation plan for the Gillen Review recommendations in relation to serious sexual offences cases at the meeting on the 11th of February. The committee noted the position at the time and requested a further update in September. The department has provided a written update which summarises the current position and future plans for the main programme work streams and outlines the current position regarding funding and resources and the work of the education and awareness uh, group. The briefing paper indicates that good progress has been made, with 28% of all the Gillen recommendations now fully implemented. Work is underway in over 60% of the remaining recommendations, and less than 12% have not yet been initiated, with the vast majority of these requiring legislation that is not scheduled for this mandate. The Department has also advised that the partially and fully implemented recommendations are already having a positive impact um, on victims. Um, Members, this is just to note, um, unless we require any further information or clarification. Um, I, I would just have a couple of points that I would like to raise. Um, so, you know, the, the brief impact states that it, it's had a positive um, impact um, on, on victims. So, I, I mean, that's pretty broad. I mean, just throw that out there. So, I think we would need just a little bit more detail on what, what those positive impacts are and if we can have a you know, a, a good um, a good look at it, just exactly how, how far reaching they are. Um, and also, of the 60% of the outstanding recommendations um, that have been started, um, how many is expected to be concluded before the end of this mandate? So I think that would be useful for us to know as well. Um, again, members, I can't <coughs> see my screen, but Rachel, you might want to raise something here, is that right? Yeah, thank you, um, as usual. <laughs> um, the, uh, the just, um, I might have missed it in the pack, but of the 12% outstanding that require legislation, it's not possible in the mandate, and I fully appreciate that. Uh, do we have a list of what they are? Uh, again, I might have missed that just in the briefing pack, because it was quite substantial. 
Um, and, but if, if we do know what it is, is there work going on to prepare for that legislation to, to be enacted you know, in the next mandate? Is, is, is there preparatory work going on? And second of all, is with regard to the protocol to expedite serious sexual offence cases involving children under 13 years old. I know that had rolled over and it says in the pack that it, um, it was the further extension was over in October. It's October tomorrow, so I'm just wondering if there's been any consideration given to continuing this, and does this mean that as of tomorrow the uh, protocol on expediting zero sexual offences cases involving children is no longer? Because I think that's something the committee may have an interest in. Absolutely. Um, no, members, look, we'll, we'll get answers to those questions um, as soon as we can. Um, we are due to get a further update in, in early March 2022. Um, so members, hopefully members are in agreement that we go ahead and schedule that. But in the meantime, we'll try and get clarification on those other issues that were raised today. Um, okay, members, I can't see you on, this, on my screen, but I, I presume there's, there's no more questions in relation to that. Um, okay, so we'll move on to agenda item 10 which is Deaths Abroad, the final report on the commencement of section 49.1 of the Coroners and Justice Act 2009. So you'll find this at pages 473 to 503 of your meeting pack. And just to remind members that at the request of the Minister of Justice, the presiding coroner appointed Coroner Patrick McGurgan in October uh, 2020 to chair a working group to explore the implications for the justice system of commencing section 49.1 of the Coroners and Justice Act 2009 to allow a coroner to hold an inquest into a death abroad where the body has been repa repatriated and is lying in Northern Ireland. Coroners in England and Wales, Scotland and Ireland already have jurisdiction to investigate a death occurring abroad. The working group was originally to have reported by the end of January 2021, but required more time to consider a number of complex issues and resourcing implications. The group has already completed its work and the department has provided a copy of the report which outlines significant practical issues which would limit the effectiveness of an inquest into a death abroad. The working group has therefore concluded the practical challenges of investigating a death abroad if section 49 was commenced would lead to public uh, expectation which in most cases could not be met. This would leave families disappointed and ultimately risking confidence in the justice system. The working group has therefore recommended that section 49.1 as it currently stands should not be commenced and instead new legislative provisions could be put in place which would provide for more managed and proportionate jurisdiction uh, when investigating a death abroad. So again, just to advise members, the Minister of Justice is open to the view that rather than commence section 49. Uh, some more managed way of approaching the matter should be sought and she's likely to consider that a consultation paper on reforming the jurisdiction of a coroner in respect of a death abroad may be the way forward. The department has indicated that while it, while it will continue to progress this matter, it is unlikely that resources will enable a consultation paper to issue during this mandate. So really, members, what we're asking today, um, firstly, we're asking your views on whether you're content to note the report of the working group and the position of the Minister of Justice or whether you wish to submit any views or comments on the matter or require any further information, either in writing or by way of an oral briefing. Um, we have had correspondence from Geoffrey Donaldson, MP. Um, he's previously written to the committee on behalf of an individual. Um, so, you know, if members are in agreement, I think it's only right that we respond back to, to Geoffrey, advising him of the latest position on the issue. Um, so, just members, I'm going to throw it out. Um, Sinead, I think you're you've indicated yes thank you chair and i suppose i would like to go on record um, to welcome this um report back and to thank i know that the kevin bell repatriation trust and um, were heavily involved in the work on this and i'd like to go on record to thank them and for everything that they do but i do find it a bit disappointing that um all those efforts really have um come to a stalling position where there is no uh, definitive outcome and that the minister really hasn't made any sort of a decision. And I do, I do take on board the point um, where we, you wouldn't want to get the hopes up of any family or loved one who was facing such a, a devastating set of circumstances. But that said, um, are there not ways of managing those expectations? Have, we, have the department fully explored that? 
um, and rather than just rule out entirely um, the possibility of enacting this. So I just would like a bit more detail on, I wouldn't want to dismiss the whole piece of work based on, on that one reasoning. Um, I don't really follow it and I would just need some more clarity on it if possible. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, no, certainly concur with those those comments, Nate. Um, I mean, again, I'm only new onto the committee and looking at the for, for forward work programme. It's pretty heavy duty, but I mean, I think if there was a way that we could maybe schedule in um, an oral briefing or even a, a written briefing that is, you know it's more substantial in terms of of information and detail, would members be agreeable to to looking at that? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Um, thank you, members. We'll. We'll take this away. We'll have a look at it, and we'll see if we can fit in um, either an oral briefing or a written a written briefing to the committee just on this. So, um, thank you, members. Um, okay, listen. We'll move on to agenda item 11, which is correspondence. There's four items of correspondence um, at pages 505 to 561 of your pack, and uh, there's one item at page 32 of your table pack. So, can I just draw your attention to one of the items in the meeting pack <coughs> and one in the table? The table pack. So, um, again, if members have any, uh, are there any other items of correspondence with which they have a particular interest, just just indicate to me, and I'll, I'll bring you in. Um, so, item eleven point four of the pack is correspondence from the committee for finance regarding new decade new approach funding of forty million for the unique circumstances of Northern Ireland. Um, and to advise members, the executive office has indicated that detailed spending proposals in relation to the unique circumstances funding are to be produced by the NI and UK departments. So I'm looking agreement from yourselves today um, that we asked the Department of Justice for its detailed spending proposals relating to the unique circumstances funding. Agreed? Agreed. Okay. Um, item 11.6 is a response from the Criminal Justice Inspection Northern Ireland regarding the timescale for completion of the review into the operation of car and supervision units um, in the Northern Ireland Prison Service. And the Chief Expec uh, Inspector anticipates that the review report will be published in November and will inform the committee of the exact date, date when known. She has also indicated that she is happy to discuss the report following publication if the committee would find that useful. Um, so again, members, that's just to note, um, but we will, uh, you know, we, there will be further consideration um, given to whether it would be useful for the Chief Inspector to attend uh, to discuss the report once members have had the opportunity to, to consider it. So once we've all, once that's been published and we've had a look at it, we'll, we'll schedule that, um, that, uh, that meeting with the, uh, the Chief Inspector. Um, Rachel, sorry, again, I can't see, the screen's gone. So. You're okay, uh, no, it's grand. I uh, just was going to say, I would, I would think, you know, well, without being presumptive, I think we probably will want to speak to the, the inspector after the report. Just it's something that the committee's been taking an interest in, and that's last year. Um, and I suppose just to put it out there for consideration once we do get a report, it might be an opportunity for the committee to. Um, invite the independent monitoring board to, to a committee because um, the, the board and its members are not someone that we've heard from before in terms of their role with inspecting our prison. So just to put that out there as a suggestion, but I, I'm happy to make that formally if we're discussing this in November. Okay, Rachel, thank you very much. Yep, uh, no problem uh, with any of that. Um, okay, so members, can I just ask, are you content to action the remaining items of correspondence as set out in the cover sheet? or whether there's any other comments you wish to make in, in relation to any uh, other items of correspondence. Agreed. No, happy, okay. Um, agenda item 12, chairperson's business. There's no chairperson's business today. Um, agenda item 13 is AOB. So if any members have any other items of business, do you wanna raise them now? No, I don't think so. Uh, all right, agenda item 14, date, time, and place of next meeting. So our next meeting will be um, next Thursday, the 7th of October at 2 p.m. in room 30. Okay, thanks very much, members. Appreciate your patience today. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.